Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to today's Ending the HIV Epidemic or EHE Regional Learning Collaborative Session on Strategies and Approaches to Address HIV Stigma. My name is Elena Rosenberg Carlson and I'm the Ending the HIV Epidemic Coordinator here at the UCLA Center for HIV Identification Prevention and Treatment Services or CHIPS. For those who might be new to the collaborative, the purpose of our learning collaborative is really to facilitate knowledge sharing and to spark collaborative opportunities across California's EHE phase one counties to help accomplish our shared EHE goals. In the chat, you all should have an option to send a message to all panelists and attendees. Please use that option to introduce yourself to everyone by sharing your name and your location and your affiliation. So I'm very excited for today's discussion that features three fantastic presentations on different approaches to addressing HIV stigma and also intersectional stigma that have been implemented in a few of our EHE phase one counties. And the last 35 minutes or so of today's session is reserved for panel discussion on some of the great questions that all of you, all of our participants submitted during registration, and then also for open Q&A. As usual, please feel free to submit questions at any time during the session using the Q&A function on your Zoom control panel. We'll also keep the chat open during the session in case you'd like to share any comments, or resources with the group, um, but we will use the separate Q&A function for questions. And we are recording the session and we'll be posting the recording on our EHE regional response webpage on the CHIPS website within the next week. So now I'll turn it over to our first presenter, who is Gabriel Maldonado, the founder and chief executive officer of True Evolution. Welcome, Gabriel. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, can I share my screen now? Yeah, go ahead. Awesome. Can you see it okay? Wonderful. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, and for those of you that are on the East Coast or a different time zone um, that may be tuning in from somewhere else located, uh, good afternoon. My name is Gabriel Maldonado. I am the founder and CEO of True Evolution. Uh, we are a community health and social justice organization that is based in the city of Riverside, serving Riverside and San Bernardino County. So shout out to the Inland Empire. A um, little bit about who we are. We started off as an advocacy organization in 2007, and that's kind of where we came out of is the advocacy organizing space. Um, and for the last six years, we've really tried to become uh, a direct service provider that can meet the needs of the LGBT community in our region um, and people living with HIV. So we have HIV care and prevention services. We have a mental health clinic uh, and an emergency housing program. Uh, and now we're taking our first foray as a housing developer. So we are building um, new housing that will hopefully be up by the end of this year. Um, but for the purposes of this conversation, we're gonna talk about stigma. I do wanna give a disclaimer that there is uh, an alarm that has gone off in my building. It is a false alarm, so no one worry. But if you hear a little background noise, I do apologize for that in advance. Um, my presentation for today is called Leading with Resiliency um, and it's tools for combating stigma in the healthcare system. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, um, instead of really focusing on a specific program or a particular intervention that we do, I really kind of just wanted to outline seven basic principles that our agency at least attempts to do as best as we can to be tools for combating stigma, distrust in the healthcare system, and being able to meet our communities in the multitude of spaces that they may be at. Um, so these are going to be seven recommendations that kind of come out of this, and it's just easy tidbits to take away um, for your own agencies and institutions. So first, what is stigma and kind of like how I frame it and, you know, the perspective that I come from um, as, as not only an executive director, but how I look at it as an Afro-Latino, as a member of the Latinx community, as a Black gay man myself, um, you know, how I have seen and experienced stigma and how many of my population do. And so we frame it around stereotypes, attitudes, and prejudice. And very quickly, 
stereotypes are these attitudes. These are often generally assumed by a group of people. They often kind of sometimes manifest themselves as humor or as jokes. Uh, many times these are stereotypes that we within our own communities may tease or joke about ourselves. You know, there's certain, you know, insights with our, our own communities that we sort of point the figure and laugh at ourselves sometimes. And it's all out of jest and fun. Um, but, you know, oftentimes these stereotypes um, in the hands of very ignorant minds um, can manifest as prejudices. And, and these look more like as assumptions and stereotypes that an individual or an institution may assert as valid. So we see this manifest often in the uh, police industrial complex and in the criminal justice system in how there is an automatic assumption that people of color or black people or black men in particular are dangerous and fearful and that their actions and behaviors and how they express really denotes danger. So these are stereotypes that are seen and taken and then often applied very prejudicially against people. When you take those prejudices and you place them into the hands of leadership, and you place them into the hands of those that are controlling services or that determine outcomes for individuals that they're serving, this can often show up as discrimination. Um, and these are actions that are actually taken upon or, or not taken upon. It actually looks like inaction as well. Um, when you see these stereotypes and prejudices manifest themselves in the form of actual discrimination. And that's kind of the context for this discussion. Um, there's also other kinds of stigmas, types of stigma in where they show up and where in the places and spaces that they may occur. And so these are just a few of them um, as we see them showing up in our community spaces. This is where we must probably most commonly see it um, is showing it up in community. And this could look like our family spaces, our friends, our faith place, our work environment. Um, and that is probably the most common you know, manifestation of where we see stigma show up within communities. Um, for many of us on this call, we represent and work within institutions. And so these sorts of practices and illegitimate practices of how we treat people and how we view people um, shows up in our healthcare systems, shows up in the school system. Um, I think often we don't have a conversation about, you know, the levels of discrimination that are experienced in the prison industrial complex. And what does it look like for LGBT people and people living with HIV who are in the prison system? What are the different layers of oppression that they are experiencing simultaneously? Um, as in addition to maybe being HIV positive and experiencing stigma inside of an institution. Um, the last one is, is, is the point that I, I am most passionate about is the area that I feel I am the most called to work in and that's working with people living with HIV. Um, I am a person living with HIV and you know when I work and sit with my brothers, sisters, siblings who my apologies, one second. That is the alarm. I'm sorry, the fire department is trying to get in. I, I apologize, give me. No worries, Gabriel. <laughs> This is um, this is the work from home life that we're all getting used to. I apologize. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, uh, so um, you know, the last one is internalized stigma, and um, you know, a, a big part of that shows up when individuals, their experiences, their environments, and their circumstances, ends up coming into an individual in such a way where the um, the desire to have um, self-efficacy, to be able to engage in the healthcare system, to be able to speak and advocate on your own behalf, um, it becomes challenges when you're dealing with issues like guilt and sexual shaming um, and the sort of re-traumatization that occurs when individuals have to go into the healthcare system. And it makes you kind of look in your own reflection. And that's where stigma sometimes manifests within individuals that have unaddressed um, feelings around their diagnosis and how the world and their environment treats them. I, I highlighted fatalism um, because I had heard a presentation that really highlighted sort of the, the devolving sense of the spirit that happens when an individual goes so long um, where they no, no longer feel that the world could look any different for them. Um, and um, that is called fatalism, where the sense of hope has kind of died in a lot of our patients. And a lot of the patients we work with, I have unfortunately have seen fatalism manifest in a great deal number of our clients, where it's very difficult to even get them to see the possibilities. Um, uh, and so uh, 
I apologize you all, there's a, you're doing inspections here. Um, so moving on to resiliency, um, and this is sort of the response that we are trying to promote within our clients and um, really forms of resiliency can show up within yourself. So this is really helping our clients to engage in healthy uh, promotive cognitive processing, their sort of choices, their circles and their people that are around them. Their social support is a great part of responding to incidences of stigma within them. And then also their perspective. And I think that's a big part of working with clients is getting them to shift how their perspective is about themselves, about their community, um, about other people living with HIV. Um, and shifting a client's perspective is, is really where the real work happens. And these other sorts of tools, you know, looking at um, healthy promoting cognitive processing, helping them develop and, you know, synthesize their sorts of choices and how they show up in the world and the decisions that they make. These are all tools that ultimately hope result in shifting their perspective on themselves and others around them. Um, and I frame this around um, other young gay bisexual men because I, I feel as though that, you know, that is a part of my role in um, not only being an executive director, but being a, a resilient person living with HIV to try and represent that for others that whose perspectives are still evolving. Um, and there are people who are much more uh, have gotten through the process a long farther than I have, um, who have shifted and helped in my perspective in working through my own internalized stigma with HIV. Um, so seven recommendations, um, and I, I'll go through these pretty concisely. Um, so the first one is developing monolingual materials. You know, my agency, we, um, we work both the African American and we work with the Latinx community, almost 50-50. Um, and so our materials and not just the one pamphlet or the one handout, but we really have had to make investments at shifting our entire um, marketing assets and our collaterals to be bilingual. And that may be investing in uh, media and marketing campaigns that are specifically done in Spanish, not just with Spanish subtitles but that you're actually using promotores and influencers to actually create your assets. Your website is translated in both English and Spanish. We are going to be launching our, our Spanish website in a couple of days. So that has been an investment that we've had to try and make to really live up to, you know, responding with um, monolingual materials as a way for um, lowering distrust from some of our Spanish speaking population about the healthcare system. Health literacy. Um, really empowering your clients to understand the healthcare system. Um, a lot of times, as we know, that the difference between getting approved and not approved is knowing the right vocab words and being able to say the right thing to your case manager. And it is those denials, right, from these essential services or these specialty referrals that can often make a client feel as though they are rejected that their own personhood is being rejected. And so helping a client understand the complexities of the healthcare system and giving them the right health literacy vocabulary to navigate through the system often reduces the times that they experience negative encounters or rejections. And when they do, they are equipped with the vocabulary to respond, to issue a grievance, to understand how process works. Um, and that is difficult, but I think that peer support navigators, which is the third recommendation, I think those are your avenues, you know, equipping your peer navigators and your uh, peer specialists to be able to serve um, as these gateways, as these educators of health literacy, um, helping to inform the creation of your monolingual materials. Um, peer support navigators are, are really your front line um, in responding to stigma in your healthcare system, recruiting from the community that you're serving and equipping them to go out and serve their own. The fourth one is multi-channel communication tools. So we live in a suburban, rural, urban, geographic mix in the Inland Empire. So we have some individuals who are in centralized urban cities and we have folks that are in very rural areas and they have access to different kinds of technology. And so making sure that how we roll out our materials, how we send out our, our information, we try to use a variety of tools from technological tools, but word of mouth, trying to make sure we show up to events, making sure that we're meeting our clients in multiple spaces and places and not assuming that they all have the same form of communication to, to engage in. Um, integrated behavioral health services. Um, so this is really around integrating trauma informed care throughout all of our approaches. Um, comprehensive prevention and care services. So our goal and the goal that I think all of us are striving to do is meet as many needs of our clients simultaneously, recognizing that they may be going through a multitude of circumstances simultaneously and how do we address all of them at one time. And 
that may not look like it's all inside of your institution, but it could look like forming those strategic partnerships, those referrals, those linkages, really bringing in the entire village within your region to try and provide these wraparound services. And then the last one um, where I'm right at time is all of these approaches, all of the responses, all of these different types of tools that we use to really strive for them to be given and delivered in a non shame based way um, that we are being very mindful of how we approach our case management services how we develop our protocols, how we create response plans um, and recognizing that how we say something and how we deliver something. Um, often makes the difference between how a client feels. Um, and I can say we haven't always gotten it right. You know, we certainly have been evolving ourselves and there are areas that we could have done better and there are places where, you know, I didn't agree with how a client was served. Um, and that is really the evolution that we all should be on and the humility that I think we at least are attempting to, to try and digest with our clients is that the world is shifting so quickly and we have to keep up with the constant evolution of our community. So I will close there. Um, I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak with all of you. And I do sincerely apologize about this fire alarm that I didn't anticipate. Thank you so much, Gabriel. And no worries. Again, we, <laughs> we've all had those experiences. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no worries at all. Thank you so much for your fantastic presentation. And you know, for really sharing several great strategies that you are using at True Evolution to uh, help address stigma in our communities. So thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce our, our um, second presenter who is Dr. David Gear. David Gear is a professor of arts activism and founding director of the UCLA Art and Global Health Center. Welcome, David. Hello, Elena. Hello, everyone. And uh, I actually want to start out by, by saying that, Gabriel, I think there was something about the fire alarm, which is a perfect metaphor as a way to begin uh, uh, our particular symposium related to EHE, ending the HIV epidemic. Oh, my God, how do we keep that sense of, of fire alarm that it's urgent every day and that, you know, it, we're 40 years in and still there's so much to do. So here we are uh, four decades in and ending this particular epidemic is proving to be a ridiculously frustrating task. We're all trying and yet the epidemic continues. Personally, I, I wanna bring an end to the epidemic to honor my friends who died back in the 1980s. But what one thing can any one of us do? My personal commitment and the commitment of the UCLA Art and Global Health Center is to use the arts to reduce, or even I'm gonna use a stronger word, banish HIV stigma, so that unconstrained by its sting, more people will make the choice to be tested and treated. The project that I run under the auspices of the Art and Global Health Center is called Through Positive Eyes. Through Positive Eyes started 15 years ago when I was teaching a course at UCLA called Make Art, Stop AIDS, which is predicated on the notion that artists can help stop the epidemic. More than help, they can be at the center of stopping the epidemic. A South African colleague, Robert Sember, put this book in my hands, A Broken Landscape, featuring photos from the 1990s by the South African photographer, Gideon Mendel, documenting the pre-ARV AIDS epidemics in Southern Africa, the, the gnarly, part of the epidemic before anybody had effective treatment. My students and I found the photos that were in this book to be remarkably moving, featuring people living with HIV in positions of strength, advocating for themselves, even at moments when they were clearly very ill. Over the years, I've come to the conclusion that the, the secret sauce of Gideon Mendel's photography is its combination of images and first person texts offering the radical possibility of an HIV negative person identifying with an HIV positive person, even someone on the other side of the world. Here's an example. This person is loved. Though clearly very sick, he is held close by his mother 
who appears to cherish him as much as she did on the day he was born. This person has a name, Joseph Gabriel from Mwansa, Tanzania. Having a name and a location sets him apart from the, the numerous nameless people appearing in crisis porn newspaper photography. He's, he's somebody particular, somebody we can know, somebody we could meet, somebody whose name we know. And this person has a voice. He speaks. And here are the words that appeared in the book alongside the photograph. I've been sick for 10 years now. I wake up in the morning and drink my tea. My brother washes me. When it is warm and dry like today, I spend my day sitting outside my house under the shade my brother made. My mother or my brother carry me here in the morning and I stay here until the afternoon. I like listening to the radio, the music, the football, and the news I enjoy. At the moment, my life is rich. I have no pain. My belief in God makes me happy and I have the love and care of my family. Taking together all these things broke open something very deep in my students and in me, allowing us to walk a bit in another person's shoes, to identify with him, with Gabriel, with Joseph Gabriel, and to care about him. That's how stigma is shifted and destroyed, I thought. That's how it's banished. And so I tracked down the photographer, Gideon Mendel, where he was living in London. I cold called him. I told him how his work affected me and my students. And I asked him if he would consider working on a project together with us at UCLA. He said, yes. Since then, Gideon and I have developed a photo storytelling workshop that we've offered in a dozen cities, Mexico City, Rio de Janeiro, Johannesburg, Washington DC, Los Angeles, Mumbai, Bangkok, Port-au-Prince in Haiti, London, Durban and Cape Town. At this very moment, we're in Seattle working with the Gates Discovery Center, which is the public facing unit of the Gates Foundation. In each city, we partner with local organizations to identify about 10 people living with HIV and AIDS who are willing to speak publicly, to share their stories along with images from their lives. We provide simple point and shoot digital cameras and training on how to use them creatively. Over a 10 day workshop, we assign basic photography 101 exercises, things that you've probably done in, in photography courses you've taken yourselves, like shooting from above to convey a sense of passivity or smallness, or shooting from below to make the photo subject feel big and important. We demonstrate how to turn off the flash so that subtleties of light can animate the photo frame. And importantly, we teach how to use the self timer and tripod so that each person can take their own creative self portraits without need of an outside photographer. By the end of the 10 days, each person has created a body of hundreds of intimate photographs completely of their own making. And they have also married those images to the story they want to tell. As they graduate from the program, we confer a special title on them, artivist because they are now both artists and activists ready to share their photo stories with the world. They may do this either live or during COVID times online in order to banish the stigma associated with HIV. At this point, we've trained nearly 150 artivists in a dozen cities or so, all of whom were featured on our Through Positive Eyes website, and here it is. The site is used now as a tool in Los Angeles Unified School District health classrooms and in exhibition contexts, exhibitions for the public at large, such as the one sponsored online now by the Gates Discovery Center. Here's an example of through Positive Eyes photo storytelling in video format from our website. This one located in D Durban, South Africa, 
And the artist's name is Sumiso. Prior to finding out about mastitis, I was riding on the assumption that, you know, HIV is for old people. It was something I looked at as being far away from me, you know. I had a very normal childhood in, in terms of um, a young South African boy. I had both my parents from birth and up until now, you know, we've been living in, under the same roof. So mom and dad did play 50-50 in terms of raising me. When the diagnosis initially came, I couldn't see myself in the future. I couldn't see myself achieving anything. I felt like a failure. I felt like a disappointment to myself, family, and friends. And I started looking at everything that happens. It was always related to HIV. I could bump my toe and I'd be like sitting down, feeling like crying, thinking, oh, God damn it, this HIV is making me trip and fall now. HIV was Simiso and Simiso was HIV. A lot of uh, fingers were being pointed at me I have another girl, and when we met, I don't disclose right away. I like to let the person know me for who I am. Her grandmother was one of the very few people when the outbreak happened in this country who were chosen to be the leading task force on the fight with HIV. So her grandmother has been fighting HIV from the, from the word go up until now. She has been teaching her about HIV, uh, making her understand HIV. So when I disclosed to her after maybe a year of dating, she, she, she gave me a hug and she said, shame, you poor thing, and she gave me a kiss. I just can't be another guy with HIV who's just gonna take his treatment and keep quiet until he dies. And now HIV is a shadow. It's a source of energy now. I cannot just sit and be idle. I want to be a positive person who inflicts change and gives another perspective to negative and positive people. One of the 150 or so artivists who work with us now in this project. So you may be wondering how this strategy could work for you in your various roles in the very many counties that are served by this EHE project. And you know, one thing I'd want to offer up is that the website and its materials are available for anyone and to use for any purpose. We we use them primarily, as I said, in the LA Unified School District, working with the ninth graders. And I'll talk about that more in our panel discussion afterwards, why ninth graders and, and what the impacts have been. But I could imagine other contexts where this could be used in community groups, for community groups, or other modes that could assist in reducing stigma. The project itself is actually very simple if you wanted to replicate it. It's just photos and stories. 
created and shared by artivists, though I must confess up front that it helps to have a group of dedicated artists to lead the workshop. It's not like something that you can just do on a, a, a moment's notice. It takes a lot of care to set it up. But once you do, and once you, you make something like this uh, with your own hands and in your own community settings, it is it results in something that's unlike the sort of communication you would expect from say an advertising campaign. The images and stories by contrast to such a campaign are honest and they're vulnerable and they're imperfect. And maybe that's why they work so well against stigma in my view, precisely because they are so authentic and so real. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, David. Um, thank you for sharing your really powerful arts activism work and uh, looking forward to speaking with you more during the panel discussion. So now I'll introduce our final speakers, um, Alejandra Aguilar and Carla Morales. Alejandra is a lead health educator and an HIV counselor over at UCLA Women's Center. And she's um, joined by her colleague, Carla, who is also a health educator at UCLA Women's Center. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elena, for the opportunity. Thank you for inviting us to present. Um, I would like to share my screen. Um, please, um, one second. Thank you so much. Um, so again, I'm Alejandra Aguilar Avelino. I'm here with Carla Morales. We are both um, health educators at, and HIV navigators at the East Los Angeles Women's Center. And what we wanted to do today is to give you an insight into the work that we do um, as far as HIV prevention goes um, in addressing stigma in our communities. And we would like to share with you a little bit about uh, the services that we offer and what our approach to serving, um, especially uh, women, Latinx women in our communities uh, looks like. So the East LA Women's Center uh, was actually founded in 1976 by uh, women community volunteers who established the first bilingual sexual assault hotline in the nation. Uh, we are actually uh, one of the very few rape crisis centers that has an HIV prevention program. Um, and in actually in 1985, the East Los Angeles Women's Center began operating the Southern California AIDS hotline. Um, and it is still operating now, the bilingual HIV information line is still um, up and running. And today we're actually recognized as a leading voice for um, thousands of survivors. So we primarily um, provide services to survivors of trauma. Um, survivors of domestic violence, survivors of sexual assault. Um, our services are culturally responsive services and our focus is the Latinx community uh, in the areas of, again, sexual assault, domestic violence, HIV, and other services that um, interconnect. Um, our purpose is to ignite. Our purpose is also to um, provide um, the people that walk into our doors with an opportunity to begin healing. Most of the people that come to the East Los Angeles Women's Center have been affected by um, domestic violence, by sexual assault, um, complex traumas. Um, and what we offer for them, um, in addition to HIV prevention services, is we provide housing services. Um, we provide uh, youth services. Um, and our course um, intervention services is therapy, we provide um, counseling, support groups, community engagement. We have um, several collectives of community promotoras, promotores who are not only um, trained as sexual assault advocates and domestic violence advocates, but who are also fully trained in HIV um, and who, got, who go out into our communities and bring awareness about these issues and are able to uh, link people into services, um, people that otherwise um, we might not be able to, um, to reach. Um, all of the services that we provide are rooted in um, positive cultural influences that help families become grounded, center, and interconnect. Um, one of the things that we, also, um, that we also do is we engage, we try to engage the whole family. 
uh, from, from the youth um, to the male partners of our, our clients. And the focus is, is for that. The focus is to create um, safety, safe, uh, healthy communities. And we use a, a holistic trauma-informed and family-centered approach. Uh, we are actually one of the very few um, repressive centers that um, also has one of the few shelters that is based out of a hospital uh, that is um, able to immediately respond to the needs of survivors uh, who are affected by sexual assault, domestic violence, uh, sexual exploitation, human trafficking, or um, are living with HIV. Um, and one of, the, one of the ways that we respond to HIV and one of the ways that we address stigma is uh, by um, ensuring that um, the systems that um, provide services to uh, survivors understand the impact um, and the connection that HIV has uh, with trauma, with sexual assault, with domestic violence. Amongst the direct services that we provide, the individual therapy, the case management services, the crisis intervention services, um, it is all of those services are, are provided by staff who is fully trained um, in HIV, who understands uh, that they, um, as individuals and, and all of us as a collective, have a unique uh, way to respond to the HIV epidemic, um, that we have a, a commitment to um, address stigma. Um, so um, every um, MSW, every therapist, every counselor, every sexual assault advocate, from the front, um, the person that is at the front desk, um, from our volunteers, everyone across the board is trained on HIV. Be able to um, you know, talk to a person um, who uh, they are able to respond to questions that people might have about HIV. And um, not only do they advocate for the prevention of violence, but they also advocate for um, ending the, the HIV epidemic. These are again some of the services um, that we that we provide. And the purpose always is to create an, uh, an environment that supports trauma-informed um, services that helps survivors use skills that they already possess as well um, as to build new skills. And I focus and I mention um, again and again, survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence. One of the, um, one of the latest numbers or the latest statistic that I would like to share with you um, to show how connected um, trauma is, sexual trauma with um, HIV is every 73 seconds, a person in the United States is sexually assaulted. So it's every, every uh, 73 seconds. And we do know from experience, uh, multiple studies show um, the stories of people, you know, that, uh, that say how sexual assault, um, trauma, childhood abuse, uh, violence, um, can be the door, the, the, the door that opens uh, for HIV to come into someone's life. And so um, by us addressing domestic violence, by us helping a survivor heal, by our advocates um, preventing um, or working towards preventing sexual violence, helping someone heal, we are very well also indirectly preventing HIV. Um, I'm going to uh, move forward to um, and explain to you, share with you, what are some of the things that we um, that we do as far as um, HIV, uh, creating awareness, providing direct services, and also working um, to um, fight stigma. Um, these are some of we wanted to share with you a couple of visuals of what it looks like the services that we that we offer as far as HIV for Latinx um, women in our communities. We offer health education risk reduction services, um, trauma-informed HIV navigation services. Uh, again, we have the HIV information line. And one of the, one of the things that we do um, is we, um, at the East LA Women's Center, the staff, um, primarily the staff that works in the HIV department, um, engages with every community possible we, one of the things that we uh, wanna do is have conversations 
with people that otherwise will not be talking about HIV. Uh, one example will be, uh, we'll, we partner with a law firm um, a couple of years ago, we partnered with a local law firm. And this law firm uh, was a law firm that primarily served um, the Latinx uh, community in, in the areas of immigration. And they had a community room. They had a community room. It was a conference room actually that they had. And they uh, gave us the opportunity to host um, awareness uh, workshops on HIV. So for uh, a good number of months, we used to go to this law firm and provide information to their clients. And of course, you know, people from the community were invited. And um, one of the things that we saw is that had we not been given that opportunity, um, people would have not, those people that um, received the services of the law firm otherwise would have not been able to receive information on HIV prevention. They would have not been able to get linked into HIV testing and other services. And so um, we, we maintain that. We um, engage with um, providers um, that do not offer health-related services, and we find commonalities with them. We find common ground. We try to find common ground, and we um, challenge them. We actually invite them. We um, ignite that um, desire in them to also um, create awareness for their communities. Um, we have uh, been building since 2015 uh, virtual networks. Um, so again, because our primary focus is uh, Latinx gender women, um, we do traditional uh, outreach where you know we go out on, on the street, we go to, um, prior to the pandemic, we used to go into the bars the local uh, cantinas, those mom and pop bars in our community where um, women work. Um, and at times women are sexually exploited or even trafficked. And uh, we, you know, gain the trust of the owners of the bars, the cantinas, um, so that they can give us an opportunity to talk to the, to the women, to talk to the women that work there. Um, and we have, we successfully um, do that and we connect them. We connect these women to, um, to services. We try to uh, partner with um, our local clinics too, uh, the local um, uh, centers, health centers that offer HIV testing. Um, and we make sure that our clients uh, know that they can go, that our community can go and get tested. Um, and we advocate for them. Um, one of the things that we, um, that we wanna do so that people don't have this fear of HIV is um, we let them know that we are in a new era of HIV, you know, um, that the information that is now provided is more sex positive, that is uh, being driven uh, with information about their sexual and reproductive rights, um, with um, reproductive justice, and we encourage them. We encourage them to challenge also uh, those very rigid, cultural norms, those cultural norms that tell um, uh, women, um, you know, uh, you know, it's don't, don't, um, don't disclose your, your, your pain, don't disclose your trauma. Um, and we challenge them to, to, to talk about that um, because we know that there's a direct connection. We know that when they begin to heal, right? Their health is going to uh, improve. Um, since, again, since 2015, we have been um, engaged in, in virtual um, communities and virtual networks. So we establish our presence as HIV um, educators, as the people that can connect you, you know, um, to services, right? And so if there is a virtual community where women are talking about makeup and hair and parenting or are looking for just general resources or the or virtual community where they're talking about sexuality, we are there, um, never imposing, never dictating. We are there and informing them that, hey, we're your local HIV provider. And we want you to know that um, we are the face of what a provider looks like. And along with us, there's a bunch of other people ready to support you. Um, and we introduce them. We introduce them to not only our services, 
but we let them know that right down the street, there's an Altamid. Uh, right down the street, there's a Wesley Health Center. There's a VIA Care. There's your local um, public health clinic where you can go and get tested. Um, and we do that and we share it with hope and with enthusiasm because we do hope that, um, that they see that um, you can be excited about your health, you know? Um, and that's one of the things that we, that we do. Um, throughout 2020, which was a very challenging year, we maintained that vision, um, continue encouraging people to get tested. Um, and we prepare activities um, for our clients um, a lot of times, uh, or for women, the, the women that we, um, that we try to connect with um, to engage into prep services, HIV testing, or even HIV care. We try to put together activities that don't feel too threatening at first, right? Um, one of the things that we do as an example, we put together um, self-defense workshops. We call these preparada. Uh, workshops where women learn about is basic self-defense. Uh, they also learn emotional uh, self-defense techniques and infused in that, in that training, uh, we also talk about the importance of being healthy from the inside out. And that's where we began with uh, um, to have a conversation about PrEP. Um, and so we do it in a way that they feel um, that this information about HIV is, is not scary. Um, again, because many of the, um, of the people that we encounter in our communities still have this idea that um, HIV is, is something to be afraid um, or even if it's, or that it's something not to disclose to others, right? And so we, um, we have conversations with them. We present it in a way that um, slowly they begin to see it as there's nothing to be ashamed of if I am HIV positive, right? Or there's nothing to be embarrassed about if I wanna go get tested. Um, at the same time that we are providing um, HIV um, services, we are also um, uh, engaging people on conversations about ending violence um, against women, ending um, uh, child abuse, um, because we know the direct connection and we know that um, it's almost like a domino effect. A person, a child is uh, assaulted, an adolescent is abused, an adult goes through sexual trauma, uh, violence, interpersonal violence, and um, without healing, the effects of the trauma can really take a toll on the person um, and can put them on a, uh, on, on a path or higher risk for HIV later in life. Um, some of the things that we do um, or that we focus on is to let, them, let women know that safer sex, fun, enjoyable, safer sex um, is part of their self-care. Um, the majority of the... Um, clients or the people that we service um, or provide services for are survivors of uh, either sexual assault or interpersonal violence. Um, but focusing a little bit more on those that are survivors of um, sexual assault, one of the, um, one of the things that we see, um, we have seen for years and, and studies also show it is that survivors tend to um, cancel their appointments for uh, pap smears, they tend to uh, cancel their appointments for STIs. They can be very um, uh, re-traumatizing for them. Um, and so we put this focus on self-care. You know, it's part of your self-care. Um, like um, Gabriel was saying, you know, um, when they are speaking with a provider that is trauma-informed, a provider that speaks their language, that knows their story, and is um, trauma informed that understands um, that when they keep canceling their appointments, um, it's not because they don't want to. It might be too scary for them, right? Uh, it might be that their body is their body is reacting. And so, as as providers that understand trauma, we are there with them, and we are able to um, assist them with grounding so that they can uh, feel more comfortable uh, making that appointment. 
Um, so these are some of the things that um, some of the things that we do. Um, at the same time, you know, when we are when we provide um, HIV services, um, not only are we faced with um, HIV stigma, uh, but we are also faced with other stigmas. And at, at the same time, the people that we provide services for are faced with these other stigmas. They're um, faced with um, the stigma um, of being survivors. They are faced with um, the stigma of being um, survivors of sexual assault or domestic violence. And so it's um, different stigmas all at once that our clients are facing and that we are facing um, as well. Um, and we challenge these, you know, we challenge these um, stigmas. We actively work to, um, to end them. Um, again, uh, one of the things that we do also to, to fight stigma is through our um, sexual assault advocates. Um, the sexual assault advocates are crucial for um, assisting survivors uh, of rape. And they uh, go through an ex uh, extensive training on HIV so that they can advocate on behalf of the survivors so that they can support them when they receive their forensic exam so that the survivor um, feels more comfortable saying yes to their HIV test, following through with their, with their um, appointments. Um, so these are some of the things that we do to um, or some of the things that we are doing um, as far as um, HIV prevention. And again, um, the hope and the enthusiasm, we bring it with us when we go meet with uh, a provider who is not an HIV provider. Um, when we go and we tell them, hey, we want you to know that, um, you know, we're in the neighborhood and we would like to um, connect people to uh, receive services with you. And we would like to let you know that the people that we um, are going to refer um, to you um, have endured difficulties. And we just wanna make sure um, that you are aware of that and that you will be more patient um, if they cancel their appointment. You will be more patient if they come in um, and they get a pap smear and they're trembling and they are scared. Um, and uh, we have been very fortunate that um, the providers that we have connected with, um, the providers that we are going to refer our clients to have responded really well. Um, there is one uh, partner who is amazing, There's several partners, um, and I'm, I'm hoping that some of them are here listening to this presentation, but I can tell you at the top of my head, um, we feel extremely grateful um, at the East Los Angeles Women's Center to count with partners such as Ultimate, who is able to make uh, space and, and, and room so that if our client, let's say one of our clients who is in an unhealthy, abusive relationship wants to get tested, but she only has a, a small window of time small window of time when the partner's not at home and someone is able to watch the kids and she only has about 15 minutes to go and get tested. Um, they have been amazing because they make that space so that she's able to go get tested and um, can do so in such a short amount of time. That has been amazing. Other partners like uh, Wesley, who is understanding um, understands trauma and is able to respond really well to the needs of the survivors that we connect. Um, and so again, this is, um, this is what we do. Um, we are always very uh, hopeful with our clients and we never give up. For our communities, one of the things that we found to be very helpful is when we tell people, um, you're not alone. In those three words, really make an impact. You are not alone, and we are here with you every step of the way. We can be there with them even when we are not physically present through texting, uh, with the phone call right before they go um, to get tested, right when they come out and they have the results. Um, it is very, um, very rewarding 
to be one of the first people that they call and say, hey, I wanted to share with you that I did get, um, get tested um, or um, like that not long ago, um, a client, a person called from the hospital and she was very reluctant to share um, her status. She arrived at the hospital very ill. And the first number that popped into her mind was to call the HIV information line. And she asked, do I tell them? Do I tell them what I have? I don't want to tell them because I'm so scared. Um, but should I tell them? Right? And so the response to her was, if you want to, please go ahead and do so. And do it with your head up high. Um, and the client did. And she called after to say, thank you so much. Not only um, was I given um, you know, the, the right service, but the nurse held my hand. And that for her was amazing to know that the nurse held her hand. She was very happy about that. And she said she did not get scared when I told her my diagnosis. Um, and so again, when we tell people we are here, every step of the way we are, right? And um, we do hope that we can connect with many of you who are here, either virtually or in person if you are local to, um, to the Los Angeles area, but connect because to be able to end this um, epidemic, the HIV epidemic, uh, we need a united strong front, all of us together. It is possible, we can do it, we can end this, um, this epidemic. In order to do so, it's important that we are united and that we also fight and address um, other issues like homophobia, um, violence against women, childhood abuse, very important um, that we do so. And so again, I really, um, I really wanna thank everyone for inviting us to, to talk about the services that we offer and how we can move forward and um, fight um, stigma. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Alejandra. Thank you for sharing your approaches to, to really addressing the intersectional stigma um, that many of your clients face at East LA Women's Center. Um, I'd like to now invite all of our panelists to turn your videos back on and we'll have a little bit of time now for some panel discussion. All right, wonderful. So um, some of our participants submitted a few questions during registration ahead of time. And there were a couple of questions that were really common from our participants. So I wanted to kind of start there with our panel discussion. The first question is, how can we address HIV stigma in organizations and communities that really aren't comfortable talking about HIV? Um, and so kind of what are some ways to maybe start the conversation where there's a high level of discomfort? And I wonder, um, Gabriel, if you might wanna get started with that question. Sure, I'll take Thank a stab you. and, and, and I, I'll just give the preface that there is no one right way. There's, it's about meeting communities where they're at. And so my first recommendation would be, don't talk about HIV. You know, the, the discomfort that is felt by the individuals and by the community is an absence of relationship. Um, I have had the most transformative conversations with people who you would think are very on the farthest end of having any kind of a progressive, social justice, intersectional conversation. And you discover that there's so many connections in their own lives that begins to open up the conversation. And many times it doesn't begin with HIV. It could begin with a different conversation. And so my recommendation is to whoever you're talking to, whether you're talking to the patient or whether you're talking to another advocate or whether you're speaking to an official, whoever you're trying to kind of reach, beginning with, with a common ground, as Alejandra had mentioned earlier, is finding that initial common ground and it may not look like HIV. Thank you, great. Uh, David, did you wanna comment on that question as well? What sure. are some ways folks might be able to start the conversation? Well, I'm not surprised that, that Gabriel, who is, uh, you know, a sensitive and, and thoughtful community organizer, would immediately think about not talking about HIV as a way to begin. I think that's really smart. Uh, 
You know, my own experience with this is about working with the kinds of uh, community gathering spaces that serve the arts community. And, you know, I, I'm somebody who's ambivalent about museums. I'm ambivalent in the sense that so often we feel separate from museum spaces, but on, on the other hand, they're often beautiful places to collect ourselves and to, you know, think about things in a sustained way. Recently, we were able to bring the Through Positive Eyes exhibition to the Fowler Museum at UCLA. And sometimes there's an awkwardness about that, you know, diff difficult to encourage people to come to an exhibition about HIV. But on the other hand, there are other things in the museum. And so people come to see all the things that are there and then they stumble upon this exhibition, which is about the voices and the photographs and the images associated with the, the lives of people living with HIV. And that was my favorite kind of experience to, to have. That is the, the people who stumbled in, the people who didn't plan it, uh, and in that sense, it's kind of parallel to what Gabriel is suggesting that maybe the best way to start conversations about HIV is to start with something else. I wonder about Alejandra, you know, what your, your sense of this might be. Yeah, and I, I agree. I agree. Um, and, you know, again, I, I do mention that one of um, our approach to that, especially when, again, you know, we, we are faced with you know, we not only talk about HIV, but sexual assault, trauma, domestic violence, human trafficking, sexual exploitation, and we throw in, you know, um, sexual and reproductive rights. So a lot of times we, we receive many no's and that is okay. We, uh, we continue, you know, opening, um, inviting people to have this conversation. Again, like, uh, like I said earlier, common ground, but first and foremost, we listen. We listen, um, we listen with a lot of respect uh, uh, and we maintain that presence. We just let them know, hey, whenever you're ready, we can begin to, hear, to, con to have this conversation. But we're always curious why the reluctance. We're always curious and we do ask in a very respectful way. I wonder why, like, what is it? Um, and most of the time is, again, stigmas uh, on other issues, you know, um, and so again, it's common ground in a very respectful way. We, we challenge them and we ask them, you know, let's just sit down and have a conversation. We might have something that can be beneficial for your clients or for the communities that you service, right? Um, amongst the conversations that, that we've had with many people that have been reluctant, uh, we let them know, you know, there might be a person or two in your staff who is living with HIV that have not yet disclosed. There might be a client or two who walk into your door, just like that law firm that we that I mentioned earlier, you know, there might be a couple of people and it might be very beneficial, you know, for them to feel that you are aware of this issue. You know, uh, you might be the very first person that they talk to if they feel that you don't have any biases or stigmas against HIV. And more often than not, we get people that, yay, they start placing a red ribbon or they invite us to, to, um, to have conversations. And so, you know, never give up, never give up. Um, we hear no often, continue because you might eventually hear yes. Thank you. Carla, did you wanna add anything as well to um, what Alejandra shared? Yes. Um, also, my recommendation will be um, first, listen, uh, listen what the clients or the patients needs, the basic needs, and make them feel comfortable. And that way we can build a relationship with them and then we can start a conversation. Maybe not just directly HIV, but maybe about your body, what do you need? So I think it's, I, I, I think at first it will be listen what the clients need and don't impose, just make feel comfortable. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I, I appreciate you sharing that. I think, you know, that there's commonality there both in um, kind of your approach to clients and approach to providers and uh, different organizations and the broader community in terms of really listening and also working to find common ground um, so I, I think, you know, I loved how all of you kind of shared different aspects of that approach. 
I wanted to actually move to a question we recently got in the chat from Anshe. Thanks for your question, Anshe. Um, Anshe asks, how are you all supporting providers during this time as they have had to do this work with imposter syndrome, sometimes leading to burnout? Um, so what does addressing burnout in the workforce for those of us who are the work and doing the work look like? I think that's a really, a really interesting question, this idea of, you know, doing the work um, with the sense of imposter syndrome and what that can look like kind of in the workforce and how we address it. Alejandra, did you want to um, share any thoughts on that to start? Um, well, you know, with burnout, it, it's always possible and more, you know, more so during this last year, right? Um, during this last year where we Oh, you know, the, the needs of people living with HIV or the needs of prevention are still there, right? Um, um, it is extremely important, you know, for us um, to do practice self-care and true self-care, you know, um, because that is what's going to charge us to continue, right? But supporting one another um, as, as providers, right? All HIV providers, substance use providers, all providers, everyone who is um, assisting a person in one way or another to lean on each other. It is extremely, extremely uh, important. And I say that because um, that's one of the things that has helped me carry on during the pandemic is take care of myself because I know there, is, there are women out there, there are people out there that are in need of our services but what has helped me a lot tremendously is to know that I can pick up the phone and I can connect someone to their local uh, health department, that I can connect someone to Altima, that I can connect to someone to AHF, that I can connect someone to testing, right? And that um, those that we have built a relationship with as providers, I know that um, the people that we refer are gonna be well taken care of. Um, yeah, but um, definitely. And also, um, if I can recommend this from the bottom of my heart as providers, especially those of us who have ourselves been impacted by traumas, extremely important so that there is no detachment. So that when we are uh, advocating or speaking on behalf of someone or uh, even doing policy or uh, providing a direct service so that our pain does not get in the way. So a lot of times we are providing a service to a client or advocating for policy change, uh, you know, and we ourselves have experienced trauma. Many times that trauma is triggered by the experiences of our clients. So healing all across the board, it is extremely helpful because then and then we can be fully present with that client, with that person, right? Um, that's my take on that. Thank you so much. Gabriel, did you want to comment on this question as well? Um, well, you know, I, I'm not going to give you any kind of a woes me on burnout. Um, I, we are on a call with all my colleagues, uh, everybody, all the panelists, all the attendees. Um, we are all in many ways being pushed to our, our end. So this is a probably a collective support group that's happening right now. Um, but but I, I would say that for me, um, the thing that I try to I try to remind my staff. Um, is that one is that we have very clear stakeholders, you know, um, you know, I am not missioned at eradicating racism, white supremacy, ending of the HIV epidemic for the globe. That's not my role. It's not my job. Um, we are not here and cannot be there physically for all people. We have a slice. We have a little slice of our paradise um, that we are trying to create for for a group of people and recognizing your limitations is very important, particularly when you're trying to combat imposter syndrome. And you may look at your outcomes and not think that is sufficient. So instead, you, you result to do more and output and output and output and output, believing that somehow that that's creating outcome. And it isn't. And oftentimes, outcome is going to actually look like scaling back, taking this one client, 
Maybe you aren't able to case manage the huge volume that you're used to and those CDC reports are not gonna look as fluffy as you'd like them to. Sometimes it's going to be that you only cared for these individuals, but that you actually saw their lives truly transform. And I think when you can see true transformation and sustainability in that transformation, there, there is a side effect that occurs where the work returns back to you. And I think everyone on this call can say that we did not get in this field to do anything other than try and help our people and survive ourselves a little bit as we go. And, and so I think when you can actually see people's lives transform, um, that really has a way of, of, of reminding you and renewing you. And, and that looks, that doesn't look like more output. Doesn't look like more output. You know, it looks like being clear about who your stakeholders are, who are you serving, keeping boundaries with the, the parameters with your own individual work and parameters within your institution. Um, all, I, I've had a lot of times where people want our organization to do all things. Well, they're not doing this and they're not reaching these people and they're not doing that and they need to do this more and they're not, you know, so then you start running and you try to just do, 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 because you want to make everybody happy. You want to let people know that you really are doing the work. And so you just scatter and then you start grant chasing, you start mission creeping, you start getting burnout and it just spirals. And so I, my encouragement to all providers and all agencies um, is really to really reprioritize the, your clarity on who your stakeholders are dig into that particular group and, and really in this time produce outcome and, and not be so tied down and bogged with output. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and we're, we're getting some, some comments in the chat from folks I think who really connect with this idea of imposter syndrome and also just burnout in the, in the workforce. So thank you so much for your, your comments and your strategies. Um, David or Carla, did you want to share anything as well on this question? Carla? Yes, I can share. Um, I think one of the things that in our organization has helped us uh, lead, uh, manage the burnout or stress is um, having yoga uh, for the, all the staff and debriefing um, time for all uh, the staff that working with sexual assault, domestic violence. So we have that, those moments and that you can share your feelings and how do you feel and that way you are, we are everybody connected and recharge energy to continue doing our work. So I think that if, if we feel we're out, just ask for help. Ask, um, if, we are, if we were clients, connect with others and share. Share how do you feel? And, and I think it's one of the things that we are doing in our agency. And for me, it, it, it does work. In my case, I don't work with providers per se, but maybe one place where I could intersect with this question is around uh, storytelling, surprise, surprise, and, um, and the effect that, that being able to have a venue for our storytelling and for telling our truths can, can feed us and nourish us. Uh, in the exhibition version of Through Positive Eyes, the, the final room is called the Banishing Stigma Room. And in it, we invite people who are living with HIV, who've gone through the Through Positive Eyes process to share their stories and their photographs in a live setting. Of course, we can't do it right now. We were supposed to be doing it in Seattle, but we're, we're doing it online instead. But hopefully within a couple of months or a few months, we'll be able to do it again in a live setting. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that uh, it's reported to, to me and to our group, our support group over and over again, that the process of telling and retelling the story is, um, uh, it, it brings a, a, a sense of, of relief or weight being lifted. And I think it's because there's, it's a, it crosses the line of stigma. It's like it's stigma when it's silent and then when it's secret, but when the story is told out, out loud in, in words that I've chosen, in words that you know, are my very own, that it's a, a sense of, you know, I, I'm a person of value. And I actually, I loved Alejandro, the way that you talked about uh, the, the person who, shared with the provider said that you, you told her or, or someone had told her that she should hold her head up high. 
And I love that expression because that's what I, I see as a potential of the Banishing Stigma Room is that from telling the story and telling it in one's own way, that you learn how to hold your head up high and feel good about yourself, even the horrible things that might have, have happened or that you might have endured, to hold one's head up high. Thank you. And if I may add, um, you know, with imposter syndrome and, and burnout, um, you know, we as, as providers have, we have deadlines correct, right? A lot of times we work from, you know, 30 days every month, um, but our clients don't, the people that we provide services don't. And their journey to be linked into care, their journey to finally say yes to the test, their journey to finally um, begin taking their treatment might not be 30 days or 60 days. I recently received a call um, from a person who I had been supporting uh, for the past almost eight years. And it has been painful because I, as a provider, would like for her, would have liked for her to start sooner. But to get that call where she said, I am ready. I am ready. I am ready to start my treatment. I am ready to let my family know because I know they're going to be helping. That is um, amazing. And again, um, we cannot take it personal if our clients or the people that we provide services are not ready because they have their own journey. And many times they have the pain that they need to sort out before they get connected. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks so much. I wanted to, um, we, we just have, you know, a little over 10 minutes left and I wanted to transition to a question really about measurement. Um, so how, how will we know in our different efforts to address stigma when we're successful? How, how can we measure um, stigma reduction? And I, it looks like, I, I think Lori I just shared a, a similar question in the chat, and this was something shared quite a bit in registration as well. Folks are really interested in, you know, how, how do we know when we are successfully addressing stigma? Gabriel, uh, did, do you want to comment a little bit on that to start? Sure. And <clears throat> I'll again, again, say that there is no one answer because there are several tools that we could use, both looking collectively and looking individually, looking qualitatively, looking quantitatively at, at ways that we can kind of tackle stigma. For me, though, um, I think there's nothing more um, telling that when you can look at the individual client outcomes, um, I, I think I come from the case management world and the linkage world. So that's kind of where I began is, is in that space. And oftentimes we were given these, these templated rubrics for how we look at case management and the client has to be here, 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 and here. And there's this sort of one size fits all case management training that we received. But I have found, and there's people on this call that I, on this, uh, the attendees that I see that are, I consider to be world star case managers, uh, experts from all over the place. Shout out to the Atlanta folks on here. Um, but um, I think that when you can evaluate clients at the individual level, developing their own individual case plan to look at their own milestones and achieving those individual outcomes is your measurement. Because as I had mentioned in my presentation, all of these layers of compounded stigma often compress themselves inside of the individual. It becomes internalized. They become cyclical, cooperative, and co-creating in their own stigma. Um, and that's what happens when it's internalized. So the way that you cut at it is by looking at the individual, developing their own individual set, sets of milestones, and then achieving those benchmarks um, are, is the indicator that change is happening. Um, and I think there is a way to implement that at an individual client level and then being able to collect that data and sort of look at overall themes and, and big bucket items. And then that's how you can maybe tell a larger uh, narrative on your organization's uh, stigma reduction. But it really begins on customizing the individual client, client case plans and milestone markers. And that's just my opinion. I, Alejandra is nodding, but she, she may have more to add to that. Um, I could have not said it better than you. Um, you're spot on. It's um, yes, definitely um, at the individual le level, you know, collecting it and then presenting it as a whole. You're 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 spot on, Gabriel. Definitely. 
David, yeah, I wonder, um, in addition to kind of respond to, responding to this question in general, maybe uh, if you wanted to share a little more about the impacts and how you've measured those and working with your uh, with the students in LAUSD. Right. Well, the, the impacts thing is difficult when you're working in the arts because it doesn't usually boil down to a survey. You know, it's not like you can survey before and after and then you, you can tell the whole story that way. Um, instead, there need to be more qualitative uh, you know, ways to, to access what happens for people when they're having an art experience. So I wanted to tell you something actually that, that happened recently that we hadn't planned. In the exhibition we had at UCLA at the Fowler Museum, there, this is a whole huge set of the stories and images when you come in. And so you've spent maybe you know, half hour, 45 minutes anyway. And it's heavy because you're taking in a lot. I mean, it's Samiso's story and then it's like, you know, a hundred other stories. And if you dig deeply, you're, you're feeling a lot. So the way that the exhibition was set up, then you, you went into a kind of a corner space that was a reflection space. And Alison Saar, who's a fabulous LA based artist had created a, a, a response moment where you could go over to a table and you could write down on a beautiful piece of, of like a thin strip of paper, a thought or a feeling or a response just at that moment, just what was up for you at that moment. And then you could hang it on a wall on a, on a piece of twine and it would flutter in the breeze. So there was a sense of, this is a place to take a breath. And then you, when you come around the corner, you're gonna meet people who are living with HIV who are gonna be right here in the room with you and they're gonna work with you to banish stigma. I mean, it was gonna have that kind of, of practical feel. Anyways, the exhibition went for several months and when it was over, the museum turned all of those little paper slips over to us, which we hadn't thought of. We hadn't even thought to keep them, right? But what we realized was that we had a snapshot of where people were at in the middle of this experience. And so a, a bunch of undergraduate students right now are working together to code every last one of those responses. There are something like 1500 or 2000 of them. They're coding them to try to identify what was happening for people in the middle of this art experience. So, you know, that's an example of the kind of thing that, that we were trying to do, building, by the way, from the literature about stigma, because there are a lot of, of uh, you know, existing uh, uh, notions of what indicates improvements in stigma reduction and which things indicate the opposite. So we're using those as a basis, kind of as a framework, and then we're, we're building these paper responses around that to try to understand what was happening. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I, and I did wanna share with participants that um, because this question about measurement was asked by so many folks during registration, um, I consulted with one of our researchers here who does a lot of work on stigma um, here at, at CHIPS. And she did share some scales that are used in the research setting to measure stigma. So um, I, I love I love what our presenters shared. And I'll also kind of share what um, Dr. L Laura Bogart here at CHIPS shared with me in terms of um, scales that can be used, you know, in the research setting to, to really measure stigma and uh, re ultimately, hopefully, reduction in stigma as well. So I wanted to move now into just a couple of open questions that were submitted to our Q&A box. The, the first one is, um, Gabriel mentioned the need for evolving to help fit the needs of the community. Gabriel, do you have any personal anecdotes or initiatives with True Evolution uh, that you'd be willing to share or wish to share um, for adapting or evolving specifically to fit the needs of Riverside and the surrounding area. So just kind of talking a little more about that adaptation. Well, um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is actually nothing that, I mean, for uh, those of us nerds on here, will find it cool, but you know, it's not as sexy uh, of a program, but um, when COVID hit, um, we had to, all, we were already contending with very exacerbated social determinants around geography. We are a 27,000 square mile geographic region. Our, we are the largest HRSA jurisdiction in the United States geographically. Um, and so it can take four to six hours to get from one part of our two county region to the other. And 
There's only five or six HIV medical providers that are scattered across this very large terrain. Um, and so how do you, in the era of COVID, um, now render services, particularly social services, in a way that can reach these populations that have varying accesses to technology? So we invested, um, it sounds cool for a CBO, but you know, we didn't even have the internet to do telehealth, you know, to maintain multiple telehealth kind of internet is very high. Our building didn't even have equipped with the fiber optic cabling for the high speed ba bandwidth that is needed to do telehealth. So um, I, I, first thing that we did is completely modernize a lot of our technology. And a big part of that was digitizing um, the entire outreach intake and enrollment process. Um, and so a lot of times our clients are not able to get to us. If they are able to get to us, it's for brief periods of time. We recognize that sometimes a client took a two to four hour bus just to fill out a paperwork, not to get the service, just to get the paperwork. The service is gonna come later. Um, and so really being able to transform our operations as best and quickly as we attempted to at least, um, at digitizing our forms, creating an easy intake process that can be done online, creating uh, profiles for all of our clients to where if they're coming back for a return service, they not have to redo everything all over again. Um, and that may not seem phenomenal for the FQHCs or for Kaiser Permanente, that's sort of bread and butter. But for a community-based organization to have something like a client portal and these digitized intake forms and being able to facilitate telehealth services Services, and then coming up with other forms of technology that aren't as advanced for our client population that do not have cell phones that have user interfaces. This is a user interface. It makes it easier to do telehealth. But what about for clients who are on an SMS base? What kinds of services can we give to them? What kind of bi-directional information can be shared through even an SMS platform? So I think modernizing your multi-channel communication tools uh, from my presentation, uh, I think modernizing it um, has really been a tool that we've tried to do to keep up with not only the change in our clients and their and their circumstances, but to change in the entire environment, environmental landscape right now of outreach and healthcare service delivery. Thank you so much. Another question we got was for David. David, the question asks, how do you uh, get the equipment to give to the artivists um, and who taught them photography? What, what did that process look like for the artivists? Right. Unfortunately, this is the expensive part of the project and it means fundraising. Uh, we have a major funder, the Herb Ritz Foundation, and they have been the most amazing partner for us. Herb Ritz was a fashion and art photographer who died of AIDS. And the foundation in his name is meant to support both things, making photography and also assisting in the AIDS crisis. And so we've, we've joined them at kind of the sweet spot of the two things that they care about most. And so they have provided most of the funding along through the years, along with other funders. Uh, in terms of who teaches the photography, Gideon Mendel has stayed in the project right from the beginning. Uh, he's, he's taken it really seriously and he's on it. Uh, he has a, a photo educator partner, Crispin Hughes, in London, who's come with, with us to most of our workshops. Uh, and we've also made a point always to engage a photographer in the local community so that there's a sense of local aesthetics and, and the kinds of things they care about in, in a local setting and the history of photography in a particular location. So it's generally a team of three, uh, Gideon and Crispin and then a, a third local person. Thank you, David. So we are just about out of time. Uh, and I, I just wanted to take this last minute to really thank all of our fantastic presenters uh, and speakers for the wonderful discussion today. I feel very inspired by our discussion and I'm seeing that same feeling coming through the chat for sure. So, um, so thank you all again for taking the time to speak and sharing your wisdom with all of us. And I want to thank all of our attendees uh, so much for your participation during the session as well. Please do look out for an email from me later today or early tomorrow, which will have a link to an evaluation form. Um, please do take just a couple minutes to fill out the evaluation. We, we really want to make sure um, that we're continuing to you know, have these learning collaborative sessions that are useful to you and provide uh, relevant information and strategies. So please take a moment to complete the evaluation. And uh, I'll also share relevant information from today's session in that follow-up email. 
Our next session will be on May 18th at 10 a.m. Um, that's the third Tuesday. We're sticking with the third Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. And I'll share more information about that soon. But that's actually going to be on uh, sustaining our HIV workforce. So really kind of relevant to, uh, to the topic we were discussing earlier around burnout in the HIV workforce. And um, so I really hope that many of you are able to join that session. And thank you again for joining today. Enjoy the rest of your day.